All right, everybody, welcome to <laughs> welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. Here today we have Dr. Robin Hansen with us. He is an associate professor of economics at George Mason University and a research associate at the Future of Humanity Institute of Oxford University. And he's also the author of books like The Age of M, and the elephant in the brain, which will be the central theme of our conversation today. So, Dr. Hansen, how are you doing? Welcome to the show. Great to be here, and I'm wondering what you dissent about. <laughs> yeah, we will get there. <laughs> okay. I guess. So, <laughs> and I mean, the, th the central themes of your book uh, kind of give me a lot of material to to pick on people and to make them angry you know so well, that that's also another reason why <laughs> i wanted to talk to you today okay so let's see in the title of the book is the elephant in the brain hidden motives in everyday life so when you talk about hidden motives you're you're sort of talking of things that go on in our minds at a subconscious level right uh, well, I mean, uh, yes, it, it includes that. Uh, that is, we're, we're just talk. We're comparing what people are actually doing to the most public descriptions they would give of it. So, uh, say for about going to school, you look at what a graduation ceremony would say or a letter of application, and in that context, you will talk very idealistically about learning the material. And then if we look at the details of your behavior, we'd say well, that'll make the most sense if we think of it as trying to show off. And then we're ambiguous, or that is, we're not committed to a position on how conscious you are of that. Uh, we, we have 10 areas in our book where we go over and show that in each of these 10 areas, we seem to have hidden motives. And uh, different people will be uh, differently aware of their motives in these different areas. So for some people, they will say the usual thing, but they know they're lying. <laughs> and for other people, they will think they are sincere. Um, and that varies from person to person and context to context in complicated ways. And it's not really a simple binary distinction. People really have a lot of intermediate positions where they kind of know, but they kind of don't mm -hmm. uh, in a complicated way. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But don't you think that um, one of perhaps the main reasons why people don't really have direct access to all these sub subconscious stuff that go around in our minds is because uh, if we were to have access to them, then it would be very metabolically expensive for us to know, oh, I'm doing this because of that, and our brain has to uh, create all these operations uh, with the inputs it receives, and then mm. uh, as automatically as it can to produce an output. And then, sure. I, I mean, from, a, from an evolutionary perspective, it, it wouldn't really make sense for us to be aware of the of all the reasons why we do the the actions we do right well it certainly doesn't make sense to be aware of everything <laughs> that's too much <laughs> uh, and, and it's relatively quick for people to figure out what they're supposed to say that is people relatively quickly in life figure out the thing everybody says on the surface about something mm -hmm. uh, but then with time and attention you will notice a lot of details and then you will naturally figure some things out and uh, you know, at near the end of life, a great many people are really quite aware of a lot of the ordinary hypocrisies. Uh, <laughs> but they've also learned to shut up, <laughs> to, to not be too... For most of these things, people aren't interviewing you on them all the time. So it's not like you actually have to go to a lot of work to hide it. it it's not something that comes up. Uh, but if you are a specialist in the type of subject and you and you are relatively public, well, then it might be more important for you to uh, hide because, uh, on the other hand, you might be especially good at hiding. So that that's some of the things that vary from person to person, how important the subject is to you, how much anybody would be asking you about it that you would need to hide, uh, how good you are at hiding, and, and how, how much you really need to understand what's going on. So often people who are, say, salespeople or managers, uh, they have a huge payoff to really knowing what other people are doing and why. And for them, it's well worth the effort to consciously understand what's going on, even if they know they shouldn't say so in public. Yes, exactly. But I mean, I already had this conversation or sort of this conversation with Dr. Lida Cosmides last month. 
And I mean, she was saying to me that uh, when people have knowledge coming from disciplines like evolutionary psychology and even other disciplines from psychology, she, she told me that people have more representative awareness or something like that. I mean, that people are more aware of the hidden motives that regulate their behavior and they then have more of sort of an opportunity to make a decision on not behaving according to uh, negative motivations, let's say. But then I told her that perhaps she was a bit too optimistic about it because, for example, uh, I'm the dissenter because I'm on the 35th percentile in terms of agreeableness. And so when I get to know that we have these negative motivations uh, that motivate our behavior and to behave badly with other people, then I pick up on them and use it as excuses for <laughs> my behavior. So, you know, so there, there's also that side right. of things. So, th I mean, there's an enormous amount of detail from uh, different people, different contexts, different professions, different stages yeah. of life, with different roles. Um, our book is really, you know, at the very beginning level of saying the basics. <laughs> So yeah. we expect there's a lot of sophistication that people could learn if they continue to pursue the, the line. Uh, you know, many of the things that we say in our book, a lot of people know. So uh, we talk about politics, we talk about education, we talk about medicine. People who have specialized in those areas for a lifetime, they already mostly know what we have to say. <laughs> uh, but uh, they usually don't know about all the other areas. So uh, we're trying to connect, put this all together and say, look, it's not just that your area is weird and different like you thought. All through our lives, uh, we have these standard stories about why we do things, and we're wrong about them consistently in lots and lots of areas. And that's the new thing we're trying to say, that there's this big wider perspective. So, uh, you know, people who study education, they privately know mostly that, yes, school isn't that much about learning the material in the sense that people don't actually learn that much. And uh, people don't actually care how much they will learn, but still, uh, the larger world hardly knows that. <laughs> Everybody else who studies something else, uh, the thing they hear about education, is that it's about learning the material, and then that seems obvious, and it's what everybody says, and it fits this, the surface structure of things, and they don't even realize that they should question it. <laughs> Same for, again, politics and medicine and religion and lots of other areas of life. Uh, you know, we usually just start out naively assuming that what people say on the surface must be right. And then it can take us a lifetime to realize that that's wrong in particular areas that we focus on, and we may never realize that it's wrong in lots of other areas. So our book is about trying to say all at once to everyone, even at a young age, look, we're wrong about lots of things all at once, and you should change your overall perspective, especially if you're a social scientist or a human scientist that is someone studying human behavior. Mm -hmm. Yes, and another very interesting point that you talk about in your book is the fact that uh, people usually behave or perform a behavior and only after the fact do they rationalize it. So, I mean, and there's uh, those experiments that were done by people right. like Michael Gazzaniga with the split brain uh, patients, right. So, right? so, in a sense, I mean, psychologists know the general idea and most people have heard the general idea. So we're, we're in this somewhat strange situation where almost everybody knows that in principle, people can just be wrong about what they're doing. Uh, but then they still don't connect that to the many ordinary claims we make about what we're doing. <laughs> so you might think you could trick somebody into you know, not being honest about their motives for many particular things, but then you just still assume that we do the usual things for the usual reasons we say because it doesn't really occur to you to think that that could be wrong. And so our book isn't revolutionary in psychology. So unfortunately, to some degree, our, our book's been classified as psychology. And so psychologists reviewed it for the publisher and they reviewed it for newspapers. And they say, well, well-written, interesting examples, but the basic thesis is, is nothing new. And, and they're right. Uh, but we think that the conclusion is radical for people who do social science and policy. And unfortunately, it's not classified as a book for them. And so they haven't felt like they should need to respond or engage it. But uh, people who study, again, education, politics, medicine, uh, you know, charity, those people should uh, realize the whole world is different than they thought. And it should be radical for them, uh, this 
conventional wisdom and psychology in the abstract. And of course, even most psychologists don't really realize <laughs> that this applies to these many specific areas of their lives where they've just been assuming they have one motive and it's really something else. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, an interesting thread that runs throughout the entire book, I think, is the fact that you associate these hidden motives a lot with selfishness. But uh, wouldn't you say that because we evolved in a highly complex social environment and so we have these highly complex social cognitive apparatus in our minds that uh, a lot of the things and the, mot and the motivations that we have lead us to pro-social behavior more uh, perhaps than we could otherwise be? Well, we are quite pro-social creatures <laughs> compared to most other creatures. And clearly that's mediated by a lot of complicated cognitive mechanisms. Uh, our hypothesis for the reason that we're not aware of our motives uh, is that we are avoiding norm enforcement. So uh, humans are different uh, from other animals and that we have social norms. And there is this basic puzzle, if we have these motives in our behavior, why don't we know? So all of the motives we say we really have are completely reasonable motives to have. They're, they're not terrible motives to admit to necessarily. But still, the idea here is that the main, you know, co a competitive environment, a difficult environment our ancestors faced was each other. And the main way we face difficulty from other people was via norm enforcement. So human has norms. We're watching out for whether other people are violating norms. We have the norm that if we see somebody violating a norm, we're supposed to say something about it and then do something about it. We're supposed to coordinate to punish and discourage them from continuing to violate the norm. And if we don't do that, we are violating a norm. And so we're all very concerned to uh, not be violating norms. <laughs> so we are always watching our own behavior, asking, uh, can I tell a story about how this is consistent with the norms? And then we're looking at our rivals, wondering, could I accuse them of violating a norm? And in a sense, our conscious mind is mainly that machine. Your conscious mind isn't like the king or president deciding what to do. It's the press secretary whose job it is to take a potentially hostile world and defend the actions, to explain them in a, in a reasonable way so that you are as innocent as possible from norm violations. So uh, n many norm violations are in terms of pro versus antisocial. So we're, we are really eager to make our actions seem immune from norm violation accusations to, to just give a very pro-social spin on them, even if, of course, what we're really doing is also somewhat pro-social. But many pro-social things can still violate norms. And so we are especially eager to give the most norm violation-free spin we can on our app behavior. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so, um, th but then again, there are certain types of norms that we you call in the book, and I don't know if other people call as well, weak norms, that it is more is uh, much more easily for people to violate them even in front of other people uh, in certain circumstances at least sure so um the the world of being accused of norm violations includes some really extreme strong norms like norms against murder <laughs> and excludes lots of relatively mild norms like norms to hold doors open for people or to stand in line or right to not sneeze at people uh and there's all these relatively mild norms and and for many of them, being a violation might, you know, mostly get you a, a raised eyebrow or something. But we're still concerned to avoid those norm violations because still, in the in the in a, the right context, someone could put them together and make us look bad, and and it could go wrong. Uh, so, you know, that's true. Even like writing blog posts or tweets on the internet, most of the time, things go fine. But you're always wondering, well, how could somebody spin this to make me look bad? And people are very sensitive to all those possibilities, even if they're usually not realized. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so, uh, so we have kind of uh, negative motivations and positive motivations according also to the social circumstances and the cultural norms we, we are in. But uh, when, when people do something based on positive motivations, uh, they don't really hide it, right? They can even put uh, them forward as reasons why they did something. Well, uh, 
medicine is probably the chapter that will most surprise people in our book. And uh, in there we say that uh, the usual story about medicine is that we use doctors to get well. And we say what really goes on in medicine is you're using medicine to show that you care about other people and let them show they care about you. Now, as usually described, that sounds pretty positive. Uh, but it's still a motive we're hiding. Uh, it's still less positive than the one we'd rather pretend to have. Uh, we, we'd rather uh, say, well, I'm going to the doctor to get well, and, and my friends push me to go, and they care about me, and they want me to get well, and so I, I'm going to go, and, and if my friends get sick, I'm going to push them to go and help them to go because I want them to get well. And you know, the real story is more that I kind of know it doesn't work, but I still got to go through the motions of pushing other people to do it so that everybody thinks I care and, and um, <laughs> I need to, to uh, push other people to do it so that uh, everybody will think I care about them. And that's less positive, but it's still pretty positive. But again, uh, we are looking for the most positive <laughs> spin. And so even though pushing people to go to the doctor and going to the doctor to you know show you care about other people and to let them show about you, they care about you is you know, compared to most things we might do, it's still a pretty positive, nice thing to be doing for people. It's just not nice enough. Uh, and, it, and it can be accused of some sort of hypocrisy because there, there is that level of doing something while knowing at some level it's not quite, not quite what you're saying. And we'd rather just avoid the accusation of that. Mm -hmm. You know, so for example, if you, uh, uh, you know, if you said... Um, somebody invited you to an event and you said, I'm so sorry, I have something else that day, otherwise I'd love to come. And it turns out you were lying, you uh, didn't really have something else that day, uh, you, you just you know, didn't want to do it, you liked them, but you were just trying to let them off nicely. Now, at one level, letting them off nicely is a kind thing to do, certainly much nicer than saying, you idiot, why would you think I'd ever want to go to one of your events? <laughs> <laughs> On the other end, it's not quite as nice as pretending that you just couldn't go because you had some other conflict. <laughs> and so if, if someone were to expose and show that you had lied about the fact that you couldn't go, that would still make you look a little bad. And so you're trying to avoid that. So you, you try to make sure they don't know that you, <laughs> your other end. So if, you, if you're actually going to do something else, you think, well, could, they, could somebody that might get back to them see me at this other thing? Because <laughs> you're worried. <laughs> <laughs> now that you said you, you couldn't go because, I don't know, you, you were, had to, you know, clean, wash your hair that day, <laughs> that instead you're going to be somewhere else and someone might see you. And now they might report back that uh, they saw you at this thing and uh, they, the person would think, but you said you were washing your hair. Uh, and so, again, uh, you know, it's not like you were being especially mean or, or antisocial per se. You just weren't as maximally pro-social as you could possibly be. And still, that's something you'd be trying to hide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, I mean, how, how do you integrate variability in terms of personality? Because, I mean, evolutionary psychology also predicts a certain degree of variability of in course. terms of, of personality traits right. uh, occurring among people. And, I mean, there are certainly people that, sure. because, that because they are too agreeable, uh, their hidden motivations are positive and are pro-social. And, and because they are too nice to other people, it can even be harmful to Absolutely. themselves. Right. So, so the first thing to realize is, um, say, the excuse that the dog ate my homework only works because sometimes dogs eat homework. <laughs> the, the dragon ate my homework doesn't work. Because yeah. <laughs> there are no dragons, and everybody knows that. So uh, almost everything that people do, there are hundreds if not thousands of possible relevant motives. And the world is complicated. Each situation is a bit different. So, of course, averaging over a big area like medicine or school or, or religion or charity, uh, averaging over millions of people and you know thousands of situations, of course, and lots and lots of motives ended up being relevant. So we, we can't be talking about the only motive, the one motive to rule them all that, that's only in, in uh, presence there. What, what we're really saying is what's the most common motive? And there's the th motive people say, and that mo that excuse of the motive usually people say works because sometimes it's true. It wouldn't work as an excuse if it weren't sometimes true. Sometimes it is a big, you know, at least a big and sometimes even the biggest motive that's relevant. That's why it works as an excuse. Uh, but it's 
to say it's, it's an excuse is to say that we overplay how much that motive matters. We exaggerate it. Uh, it's not true as much as we like to say. Uh, that's what we're saying by saying there are hidden motives. There's the motive we say, and then there's the most common motive there is. But of course, averaging over people and situations, there are thousands of relevant motives. And you know, our first purpose was just to guess the most common motive. Now, of course, you know, our more refined analysis could tell you the most common motive for certain kinds of people in certain situations, perhaps indicated by the personality type, age, gender, profession, you know, culture. All of, I'm sure eventually you could get a much more refined estimate of the most common motives by situation. But uh, our first gut is just what is the most common? And, and right there, we're surprised to be able to say something new, <laughs> something that would surprise most people. Because you would have think at least that most common thing would already be pretty well known. So if people say the most common motive for going to school to learn the material, you would think, well, that's obvious. And that the, the subtlety is to figure out whether George on Tuesday in chemistry class <laughs> had a particular motive or not. Um, that would be complicated, but knowing that the typical ones would be easy, but apparently we're wrong even about the typical ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and we already talked a little bit about how the fact that we evolved in an environment which was very, uh, which was highly complex in social terms, um, th uh, th this same environment um, if if on the one hand it can lead us to prosocial behavior on the other on the other hand it can also endow us with motivations that are not really that positive so for example one good example i think is conspicuous consumption sure although uh even then you could say like the usual complaint about showing off is that you don't actually have the characteristic you're trying to show so say for virtue signaling or brag, you know, or bragging about how smart you are or bragging about how loyal you are. Often when people complain about such bragging or showing off, the, the main complaint is that you're just wrong. You aren't as smart as you pretend or you aren't as, as you know, et cetera, as you pretend. And so a good news, at least, is that on average, typically signaling correctly shows what you actually have. When people show how smart they are, they are smart. And when they show how caring they are, they are caring. Uh, and how strong they are, they are strong. And how loyal, they are loyal. So I mean, from that point of view, it's not so negative. That is, we, we have some positive characteristics and we show them to people and they are convinced that we have these positive characteristics. So again, it's not such a terrible thing. It's, it's even pro-social, if you like, uh, to show people you're loyal to them and you care about them and you have resources that you can use to help them. But nevertheless, it's not the most positive thing you could show. And so we actually hide it and we uh, show other things because they violate norms. So foragers have long had this norm against bragging. So even though you could argue that bragging is a relatively positive thing, that is you're showing features that other people admire and you're correctly showing that you have them, still you're bragging and you're not supposed to brag. And so you're trying to avoid the accusation that you're bragging. So you indirectly brag in many ways, but you would deny it if anybody pointed to any particular thing and you generally have enough excuses that they can't prove that you have violated the norm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th that's a very interesting view because uh, I mean, uh, even when people perform conspicuous consum consumption and they are not really aware <laughs> in full at least of what they're doing, I mean, for example, uh, s uh, now and then people are a bit too moralistic about uh, when people show off, for example, and when it's related to material stuff, that they right. are being a bit superficial. But but on the other hand, and if you look deeper at the issue, I mean, for someone to be showing off material wealth, uh, th there's uh, there's the possibility that the way that uh, that person went through to acquire that material wealth right. also shows other personality traits that are positive, right? Absolutely. For example, cons conscientiousness. Absolutely. So, I mean, you might criticize their lack of charity, <laughs> uh, but, you know, they, they might show you they have charity. So they might conspicuously show you the wealth via charity, or they might also have a lot of charity. And of course, when they show you the wealth, they are showing you that they somehow had the capacity to, to produce this wealth or to acquire this wealth. And even though 
There are some ways to acquire wealth that are not terribly impressive or admirable. Many ways are. And of course, what they're also showing you is that they care about your opinion. They want you to like them. And that values you. If they're showing off to you, specifically, they are saying, I want you to like me, and I'm going out of my way to try to show you things that you might like about me so that you'll like me. And that's still a pretty pro-social thing. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, also this thing about the prestige status. I mean, in human societies and even, in, uh, in, even in other primate societies like chimpanzees, it's not really true that... Uh, the alpha male, let's say, let's give that example, uh, acquires his position through oppressive means. I, I mean, even, right. in and even in chimp societies, they have to move along the social realm and try to gather a social and stable a, so, a stable social network to be able to stay in power. A and that also requires positive traits like uh, empathy, right? Right. Um, I mean, all very reassuring, but of course, the actual fact is that any one person is still afraid of admitting that they don't have the most positive possible pro-social motive and that they might be violating a norm. So again, uh, seeking leadership and power too aggressively or eagerly is, is a norm violation, even if the way to acquire power is to help people and to the way to acquire leadership is to be useful to the group. Still, it's a norm violation to too eagerly seek power. And so again, we are, of course, this is a sense in which we are less pro-social. <laughs> that is, we care more about not looking bad than we do about whether or not it's actually such a bad thing to seem. Uh, we, we, there's a norm against bragging, there's a norm against seeking power, and um, we are afraid of seeming to violate those norms, and we are focused on making sure our appearance is consistent with the story we tell that we haven't violated those norms, uh, even if they are not such terrible norms to violate. So, you know, of course, many of these norms are ancient, and you could reasonably question whether we should still keep them. A lot of human norms uh, go way, way back, and they may not be so useful today. But uh, again, if you're in a society with a norm, um, you, you're scared to challenge the norm and tell everybody we should stop following the stupid norm. You mostly uh, want to show everybody you're following the norm. Mm -hmm. And even the thing about bragging, I mean, we could look at it in the different light. So, for example, I mean, if someone uh, has an, an important position, let's say some sort of leader, a political leader or something like that, um, I mean, it's very difficult to be in a situation all the time, constantly, where uh, a huge group of people is focused on you. Uh, and I mean, it's really <laughs> stressful and emotionally and psychologically yeah. and so on. It's draining, I mean, certainly. And I mean, if you brag now and then, and if by bragging you acquire a little more uh, of, well, of, there's, there's, of self esteem, <laughs> then. We can, we can make an even stronger argument, which is to say that the norm against bragging means that we show off in inefficient ways. So uh, let's think about dating. Uh, three main things you might try to show off in dating is how smart and how healthy and how rich you are. And in order to show these things off indirectly so that you can't be accused of bragging, you may spend a lot of time like reading a lot of prestigious books and, and things and learning a lot of vocabulary and sprinkling your conversation with big concepts and words and references to prestigious thing, you know, things that you'd have to spend a lot of time reading as a way to show off how smart you are. And, and to show how rich you are, you might buy expensive cars and clothes and just pretend you're doing them for other reasons. To show how healthy you are, you may uh, drink a lot and show that you don't fall over very fast, or you may get into sports and, and, and spend a lot of time running hard or f competing. And all of these ways to show off indirectly are expensive. Now, today we actually have much cheaper ways to show these things off. You could show somebody an IQ test or a bank statement or a doctor's test. And <laughs> if, if you could just show people those things, you wouldn't have to waste so much effort in all the indirect signaling, which is really quite costly. But because we have this norm against the direct signaling, we're kind of stuck having to do all these expensive indirect signals, uh, which again, it's not that we don't show off. It's just we have to do it in a way that's deniable so it's not like people aren't showing off. We're not achieving the world where people don't show off. We're achieving the world where they show off in an indirect way such they always have an excuse to pretend they aren't. That's the world we're living in. So you might argue, 
being able to just more directly show off again with a bank statement or an IQ test or a, or a doctor's, te- you know, a physical fitness test, uh, that would be a better world. It would be cheaper, more f- efficient. We'd, we'd be showing off the same things we already do anyway, except that we'd be showing them off even more precisely and accurately. Uh, and so why wouldn't that be a better world, you could argue? Yes, but on the other hand, uh, isn't the the fact that people have to perform more costly signaling, let's say, also important for other people to be able to better evaluate their commitment? So, for example, if you went to a woman and proposed to her uh, uh, directly, oh, here, here, you, here you have an extract of my bank account, <laughs> so I won't well, say anything <laughs> else. You know. Well, so, so in addition to showing general features, you, you want to show devotion to particular people. Yeah. Uh, but just having expensive clothes or an expensive car or having a large vocabulary or even you know being good at soccer, none of those show attention to a particular person. There's yeah. still generic signals to everybody undifferentiated. So uh, you, you, of course, do often want to show particular people loyalty and attention, and you want to signal that. And, of course, you can't do that through general things, but, but the things we've been comparing before are all equally general. The bank statement and the expensive car are equally <laughs> signals to everybody undifferentiated. Uh, you know, a, a, a more way to show a particular person that you say are rich is to give them an expensive gift that not everybody sees. You give them privately, and now you've shown them you're rich and you've shown them that you are focused on showing them that it's them you want to impress and that's of course a different message Mm -hmm. yeah right Uh, and now uh, about self-deception because we have this interesting cognitive mechanism that uh, at the same time allows us to better lie let's say (laughs) because it allows us to uh, obscure at least a little bit our hidden motivations from our conscious awareness, right? But on the other end, there's also deeper psychological mechanisms going on, going around in our heads uh, that allow, uh, I don't know exactly at what level, perhaps a subconscious, unconscious level, to keep track of what's going around in reality, uh, right? Of course, you know, yes, we use self-deception to, uh, to to present a good image, and it comes m- somewhat at the cost of, of being able to make accurate assessments. <laughs> uh, and uh, that often surprises people because they think the importance of making accurate assessments would be so overwhelming that surely you wouldn't uh, give that up for some mild showing off benefit. And that's in the state of mind where showing off is this mild thing, and, and it hardly matters, and that's just wrong. <laughs> um, you know, cer- certainly for our ancestors and for us, uh, our social environment is by far the biggest one that matters. We're, we're far less likely to get bit by a snake or fall off a cliff. The, mo- the most of the things that will go right or wrong for us is because other people will come to like us or dislike us and treat us well or badly. That's the main thing that matters, and that's the main thing for our distant ancestors. So, um, you know, the social impression you make is in our world and has been for at least, you know, a million years, <laughs> the main environment that mattered. And so... Uh, it makes a lot of sense for your mind to distort uh, its processes in order to create good impressions, if it possibly can do that. Yeah, and it is related to the interpreter module, right? So uh, there are people at least that propose that our minds, uh, in the cognitive sense, uh, are endowed with a specific module that works in order for um, to, to put a good image of yes, ourselves of to other people out there, right? Right, and people tend to... The thing is, when people like talk to each other, they are very aware of what's in their conscious awareness, and they are not very aware of all the subconscious things, but they think of the conscious awareness as the thing in charge, <laughs> yeah. like the king on the throne. And so they think that's the center of action where the spotlight is and, and where every all the main stuff that matters. Uh, but in fact, that's the press conference room. <laughs> <laughs> that's where the PR person is, is giving their spin. Um, it's not where the main decisions are being made. There's a whole bunch of other rooms, <laughs> bigger and more elaborate and, and with people better informed, who are making the main decisions. So uh, you just have to notice that quite often you make decisions and you don't really know why. 
And of course, if asked to give an explanation, you, you come up with a plausible story, but you have to realize how uncertain you are <laughs> that that's actually the correct story, which should give you a clue that you weren't, <laughs> the you that is there as the conscious mind wasn't really uh, included in that process. Mm -hmm. And therefore, may not really know what's going on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And wouldn't you say that perhaps some social or moral norms work at the collective level uh, like rationalization? So I don't know, perhaps uh, things that come from religion would be a good example. Well, um, moral norms, um, of course, in some sense, norms are morals. <laughs> morals are norms. They're, they're the same thing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it, it's, it's the things we call morals are, are norms uh, sort of about resolving conflicts. And so different societies can have different morals, but the important thing for us is to pay attention to the morals in our society. And, and a function that the morals have to have is that a society has to be able to agree on its morals. And so that's a major constraint on morals. That is, uh, you know, we often, philosophers and others often do a, an analysis of what the best action to do would be, the most helpful one, and then you see that the moral action is not quite the same thing, and that's often easy to understand in terms of, well, morality has to be observable, monitorable. So the more, um, the harder it is to observe what people are doing, the more they will have to go out of their way to keep their actions simple and, and, and have them fit very simple moral norms so that they can uh, be shown to be following the norms. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, and a very particular aspect, a uh, very particular social aspect, the, the role that laughter plays in society. So the, uh, it plays many different roles, right? Could you give us some examples of, of them? Well, so uh, laughter comes from play. Yeah. So uh, many animals have a play mode. So you can think of, of you know, young bears or something fighting, uh, play fighting or play chasing. And in play mode, uh, they're trying to practice the real thing minus the harm. <laughs> so they might play chase and they might play flight, but they will not pull up, put out their claws <laughs> and they will not actually want to hurt each other so that they can practice. And so the, the norm of play is there's some scope of play that is unless, you know, if we're not chasing something or somebody's chasing us and then it's okay, then within a certain space and time that we're playing. And, and the mood of play is, is light and friendly uh, because none of us really expect to get hurt in play. And uh, then um, we have to be wary about whether we've left play. And so we, we need to be constantly monitoring that everybody is still in play because if, if you think you're playing and they think they're really fighting, it's not going to go well for you. <laughs> because they'll really have their claws out and you won't. <laughs> so you, you need to make sure that we all think we're still playing to keep playing. And of course, in a rough and tumble play, somebody may well get hurt. <laughs> and the moment they get hurt, they will say, ouch, and now we're out of play mode. <laughs> uh, we, we suddenly pay attention to the real consequences of what's going on. Or all of a sudden, uh, you know, there's a... a, a predator nearby that we have to watch out for or a snake or something say and all of a sudden we we give a warning and now we're out of play mode uh, we, we are dealing with something serious um so a key thing about play is we have to have these ways we show we're still playing or not and so animals and humans have a lot of ways to show that we're still playing so so when we're play fighting and, and play chasing we have a certain stylized kind of motion to to show that it's it's not the real motion uh, a stylized kind of voice and, and attitudes and and one of the things we do is we smile and laugh um, so we don't just continuously smile and laugh though um, we laugh especially more when we fear someone might think that we're not playing anymore that is when we seem to be moving toward a border or there's a warning that there's something that might be misinterpreted uh, as we're not playing anymore that's when we especially laugh to say, no, we're still playing. It's okay. So laughter is, is a reassurance that, yes, we're still playing. And so uh, if, if you say, if you were playing and, uh, and, and you were rolling and then you rule off a cliff, but it was a two-foot cliff, <laughs> and you fall to the bottom of the two-foot cliff, now you laugh. Uh, because the, just before you were falling off the cliff, you said, oh, my goodness, <laughs> I'm falling off a cliff. Uh, this might not be play mode anymore, and then you hit the bottom of a two-foot cliff, and you go, ha, 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 wasn't that funny, because uh, I thought I might be leaving play mode, but I'm not. I'm, it's, it, we're still playing. So th that's general for animals. Now, for humans, uh, laughter, again, is a key we're still playing signal, 
But humans are very social in our play. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, one of the things we play with is norms. So uh, because we don't all actually know uh, which norms apply where, when, how, one of the things we learn is norms in play. Well, that means in play, we pretend to violate norms. Or we pretend to get up the edge of violating norms. And we pretend to punish people for violating norms. We play at norm violation. And so this means we are often uh, doing things in play that would seem like norm violations if they weren't in play. Uh, which is why, you know, famously, comedians can be more honest about many things than the rest of us can. Because in the play mode of a comedian, they're allowed to pretend to violate norms that the rest of us can't. So comedians are often saying things that look racist or sexist or, or violent, uh, hostile. Uh, you know, they might like say how they really just hate that their wife does a certain thing or their husband does a certain thing and they, they wish they would die or something like that. All things that we would be terrified to say in ordinary non-play mode. But in play mode, you can say those things. And so an example we give in our book is that, you know, people often laugh at the joke uh, that if you're in prison in the shower, don't drop the soap because you might get raped. Ha ha ha. <laughs> and of course, you might think, well, what's so funny about prison rape exactly? Uh, but of course, the funny thing is, uh, we know we're not in prison and we're not going to get raped and nobody we care about is. And so it's funny for us. It's literally funny. And so, in fact, uh, a lot of laughter is going right up to the edge of and past the edge of norm violation to to appear to what would do appear to violate norms in a non-play mode, but actually do it. But of course, like insulting people or saying mean things about them are norm violations. And so, if in play mode we insult each other, well, we actually do insult each other, <laughs> but it's not a real insult because it's in play mode. And so, you can get away with insulting people. <laughs> in play mode in ways you can't get away with them insulting them in the real world. So there's a sense in which you, you can get away with real norm violations by calling them play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Because I mean, with laughter, you can convey an honest piece of information to another person. But because um, it's, it's not really good for society at large that uh, to know that you think that specific thought about that person you laugh you laugh laugh off after the fact and then you say oh i was just kidding or <laughs> something and so like that. so i've actually noticed that uh, this is one of the big ways that people are fighting politically today especially in the united states where we're having a you know a peak of political polarization <laughs> which is yeah. that you know when say people on the right like roseanne barr makes a joke uh you know people say you said that was a joke, but we're not going to treat that as a joke. That That's not a joke. And we're going to cancel your TV show and kill your career because that's not an acceptable joke. Yeah. And so they deny the ability to, to, to laugh about those things. But, for example, in uh, Austin, Texas, I went to this uh, um, you know, comedy show, which was a very left-oriented comedy show. And, and they were really quite comfortable, like, insulting basically all their political opponents in rude and crude ways. Uh, but because they're on the left, that's okay. <laughs> and that's, in a sense, how they show their social power. That they can uh, do what would ordinarily be a norm violation and call it a joke and get away with it. And their political opponents can't. And that's how the rest of us see who's in charge and who's winning the power fight. Uh, because the ones who are allowed to joke about things, and of course, that's often added as an extra thing. So, you know, uh, on the left, people have often complained that people on the right were not just couldn't take a joke and, and they just didn't have enough levity and, and you know those religious people and those conservatives are always so serious and so you know so so grumpy and so you know yes yeah. pompous etc and it's always the accusation that, that they can't take a joke but of course part of what's going on is they're not allowed to joke if, if they joke uh, that's the end for them because they don't have the social power to joke uh, whereas other people are allowed to joke because there's often the things, well, we know they're on the right side, so we know they really couldn't have had a mean intention. So surely it was just it was just a joke. Whereas the presumption on those people on that side, we just know they're mean. And if we ever see them saying something that sounds mean, we, we've proven it. And they can't, we're not going to let them have the excuse that it was just a joke, because we know they're mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do, do you think that humor or comedy should have or has any limits? Because, I mean, th there's... Uh, great discussion, as you said, occurring nowadays about 
people getting offended by things a certain comedian says and I mean uh, and I, I guess I understand that now and then when something uh, when someone makes a joke about something that is really that really impacts the audience personally or someone who went through a situation which is involved in that joke uh, I, I think it's pretty understandable that people get upset about it but sh should comedy have certain socially imposed limits or, or not? Well, um, I mean, you know, the first observation is uh, when you have rules and then you have discretion, then you often have a biased enforcement. So I'd say we certainly have a, a, a non-neutral enforcement of these uh, kind of principle that you shouldn't joke and, and, and make people feel unhappy and, and uh, be about something they're sensitive about. Uh, it's only really applied on one side. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, you know, it, I would think, you, you know, it would be better to either, you know, allow everybody to insult everybody and call it a joke or not allow anybody to insult anybody and call it a joke. Uh, either of those two are better than, you know, only saying some people are allowed to do that and other people aren't. Um, it's, it's worth noting that, uh, you know, the ancient world was pretty anti-joke. Uh, mm -hmm. Consistently, intellectuals and, and, you know, people through history have not approved of joking. It, it was, it was, you know, joking was not much of an excuse for anything. So, you know, in the last few centuries, we've changed our attitude about joking. And again, we've made this ideal. So often we say, you know, those ancients, those were fuddy-duddies and they were too serious and they, they couldn't enjoy life and laugh. And we've made laughing and, 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 and uh, humor like this ideal. We, we've put it on this pedestal as one of the highest ideals. And people often say, you know, why do you like them? Why do you want to marry this guy? And, and often the highest praise they can give is he makes me laugh. Because that's become a sacred thing, really. It's one of the most sacred experiences we have in a modern sort of secular society is laughter is a sacred experience. It's like worship or, or in the presence, being in the presence of God, really. And so uh, because of that, uh, you know, it's very hard to say people shouldn't laugh uh, because they raise it at such a high bar. But then, but then at the same time, they say there are certain topics that are so important that nobody should ever laugh about that. And so, again, that's a political power, which topics you're allowed to and which particular offenses you're allowed to label that with, what you're allowed to laugh at and what you're not. And so, yes, yes, and as you say, it can become pretty easily bipartisan because, I mean, uh, coming from the work that people like Jonathan Hyde did recently uh, about the righteous mind and how um, people on uh, are fall on the left or the right according to the moral foundations they value the most and even uh, thanks to their personality i mean it's it's very difficult to convey a joke that people laugh about in one side to the other side without it being considered offensive also because of those very deep right. biological aspects right well it's also worth noting that that humor tends to be very culturally dependent so you know it's even often hard for people to watch a movie from 50 years ago and, and appreciate the humor <laughs> so even within the same culture across time uh it's the the humor doesn't pass and of course comedies are also not things that go across international borders very well so international blockbuster movies tend not to be comedy or, or if they are they're just very simple physical comedy like mr bean i think was an international hit because everybody could just see the physical humor but as soon as you get to more abstract social humor it, it just doesn't translate and so that should make you wary of thinking that you are being universal with your laughter. Uh, often, your la often laughter again is, is this very inbred thing. So um, I mean, this is a key point. Uh, you know, there are a lot of norms that are relatively consistent across human cultures and time, like norms against murder. And then there's a lot more, uh, a lot of other context-dependent norms, like slight variation, what it's okay to say, what it's okay to do, etc. I mean, as you know, people used to like eat with their hands and, and burp out loud and, you know, those things were all fine <laughs> and now they aren't. And so a lot of the humor, because it's about showing you where the edge cases of, of the norms are, are about a lot of this context dependence. They're very sensitive to particular times and places and subcultures and what their norms are. And so that's why it doesn't translate very well is if you're going to focus on showing the edge cases of the norms in a particular time and place for a subgroup, well, that's not going to be the edge cases for some other people because the edge isn't going to be at the same place. And so it's not going to be funny for them. 
it's going to seem either to be a fine thing to do, not at all a violation, or obviously a violation. They're not going to be right at the edge of being a violation. Uh, and so again, for play, uh, when you're playing with norms, you're going to pretend to violate a norm, uh, but not really violate the intent of the norm, say. And so we can all say, well, that shouldn't really count as a violation, <laughs> at least within a certain group. Uh, but of course, from outsiders, they're not be able to, tent to tell that subtlety. They might think that looks like a violation to me. Or they might think, well, why do you even care? Um, you know, so, you know, like a norm about burping at dinner uh, to somebody who, like, since it's okay to burp at dinner, they would go, well, what's what's so funny? So he burped, <laughs> right? But, of course, in a world where everybody's very sensitive about burping at dinner, uh, the fact that somebody seemed to have burped, so, you know, there's often humor where somebody made a noise and something else made the noise, but everybody looked at you and thought, you must have farted. <laughs> <laughs> right and that that's been a piece of humor in a lot of things because you're not supposed to fart but the, the humor was he didn't really fart it's something else made him look like he fart ha 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 right but of course that's makes sense in a world where that's at the edge of the norm violation and in other worlds it's not funny mm -hmm. yeah and uh, another thing that many people or most people even tend to look down on but every one of us Uh, does it is gossip <laughs> and I mean uh, sure mostly mostly intellectual people uh, they really they really tend to look down <laughs> on people when they're gossiping and they say oh no we don't right? really we're, we don't really take information sure. from gossiping but the fact is that this our social world is so so complex that we really have to have access um, to information that come from other people about a third person because we can't really keep track of other people's behavior 24 7 and those are really important uh, informational cues let's say for us to to make decisions regarding right. other people right right so i mean there's a lot of these things we do that are functional but we still have these norms against it i mean Burping and farting are, are examples, obviously. I mean, burping and <laughs> farting have a very basic, obvious functional uses. Yeah. <laughs> but you're, you're, you're supposed to, like, do them a little out of sight yeah. uh, and not put them in people's faces. And similarly with, say, uh, gossip. I mean, everybody knows that most everybody does gossip. But there's <laughs> still this norm that you're not supposed to put it front and center. You're supposed to kind of pretend you're not doing it. You're, you're not supposed to allude to it as much or call attention to it. Uh, because it's supposed to be a little disreputable. So, uh, but it's a, it's a mild thing, but it's still a, um, it's still a mild norm violation, and so all else equal, you'd like to pretend you were doing it. Um, a similar thing might be swear words, a curse words. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, they have clear functional value, uh, but they are still norm violations in many contexts. So, I mean, the you know, interesting thing to notice is that, you know, centuries ago, Uh, the elites would show they were elites by being fragile. They would have fragile clothes, they would have fragile skin, they'd have fragile habits, and they'd have fragile emotions. <laughs> and, uh, lang you know, the, the norm against lang cursing is, is, is about that fragile emotions. Uh, so elite people would be shocked, shocked. And that was part of showing they were elites, that they could manage to be fragile. So, you know... A, a lower class person, they more often wanted to show they were tough. So their skin might be tough and their, they might have calluses and they might have, you know, uh, sunburn, and, you know, they, and they might have strong skin and be ready to fight. And they show that they are tough and ready to be tough when it's needed. And the elite would show that they didn't have that experience. They don't have calluses and their skin isn't tanned and uh, their clothes are fragile and they would they had to run in them, they would, they would fall over and collapse because their clothes couldn't be run in, right? And so over time, we have come to disapprove of some of that elite fragility. We, uh, you know, so now today, we, we expect clothes to be functional. We expect that you should be able to move in clothes and, and even run if you needed to, mostly. And uh, we don't, you know, we still give people with lighter skin more higher status, but we, we don't like ourselves for it. <laughs> You know, a few people will uh, say out loud that they like someone better because they have lighter skin, <laughs> although, <laughs> although they do. Uh, but, yeah. but that's what I say out loud. But for 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 the fragility of emotions for language, uh, they are really quite proud of it. Still, people are quite proud to have maintained the emotional fragility 
that a swear word would really just make them faint <laughs> or just shock 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 them right yeah. uh, where you know which is a kind of elite fragility that people still embrace um, whereas they haven't embraced many other kinds of elite fragility um, and so uh, again but because there's a norm uh, you know a weak you know the elite norm at least and of course there was a lower class norm and in some sense this is one of the major things that happens over time as we've gotten richer most everybody's been trying to adopt the elite previously elite norms it, it wasn't a lower class norm to be fragile it was a lower class norm to be tough uh, that made perfect sense in their world it was it only made sense to try to adopt this elite norm of being fragile and when you were rich enough to be able to afford to be fragile but as everybody tried to become elites, they've all tried to adopt at least that kind of language emotional fragility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, another thing that is related to gossip, at least I think, is the fact that people tend to favor uh, family members, friends, and people that sure. are close to them. But, but I mean, it's again the same issue, at least I think, because uh, yep. I, I mean, we are in a very complex social world, and even if people tend to look down on people that are more nepotistic, let's say, the fact is that uh, it is still at least somewhat rational to make decisions uh, th that regard people that we know much better than people that are completely sure. outside of our social network or realm, right? And so this is another example of what pro-social means, right? Yeah. So, right. So favoring your family clan is still pretty pro-social. Yeah. It's just not maximally pro-social. Yeah. So the the norm to to adopt neutral uh, norms with respect to your family is more pro-social, or seen as more pro-social than the norm to help your family. And so we are trying to hide often our being family favoring uh, because that's violating the norm against nepotism or favoring your family uh, even though of course favoring your family is still a pretty pro-social thing so selfish is not quite the right word for that I mean collectively at the level of your family it's selfish but you individually are not being selfish you're helping your family 